doing work in, in Japan, and is chief economist at the Nomura uh, Research Institute now. So I leave uh, Richard to uh, make a presentation on a question that I find extremely fascinating of why we have to learn from Japan's experience of uh, the leveraging crisis and how difficult it is to extricate oneself from such a crisis. Please, Richard. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. Um, I hope you have finished your main course by now because I am going to tell you it might not be very good for your appetite. <laughs> uh, there's actually uh, good news and a bad news, which I'd like to start with the bad news first, and that is that. As all of you are aware, there's quite a bit of confusion in the, in the policy circles, academic circles, as well as in the markets. You hear people saying, oh, the inflation is just around the corner. The others are saying, no, the deflation is a problem. All these additional monetary stimulus would uh, get the economies going. The others say, no, those are totally useless. Uh, and then we have a Republican saying one thing, the Democrats something else, Tea parties elsewhere. Uh, one of the previous speakers said there was like three categories of uh, explanations of how it happened. Was it the market failure, the uh, government failure, or whatever other failures? Well, all of these confusions that we are going through, and the fact that we are having these confusions because this is such an unusual time. Unusual in the sense that the Federal Reserve had its interest rates zero for more than two and a half years. Zero. Under ordinary circumstances, we should be seeing three or four bubbles by now. Unemployment rate probably down to 3% and stock prices going through the roof. But instead, we have unemployment rate 9% range, uh, industrial production still weak, uh, and house prices still falling. And the same story in the UK, same story in the rest of Europe as well. These are completely different from what we learn in schools. That with that much addition of liquidity, such low interest rates, we should be seeing a huge response from the economy, but that's just not happening. So that's where the confusion is coming from, and people have all sorts of ideas how these things should be, should be resolved. But because there's so much confusion, the policy has been most inconsistent, not just in the United States, but all, all around the world, and that is, I'm afraid, prolonging the recession uh, unnecessarily. Well, that's the bad news. So what's the good news? Well, the good news is that what the whole, whole world is going through, the US and Europe, happened in Japan exactly 15 years earlier. Every one of these developments that you see in Washington, in, in London, Berlin, uh, Brussels, we went through in Japan. The same degree of confusion, the same animosity between different uh, uh, players as to what is the right thing to do. And it took us a long time to figure out that this is actually a different disease. Not a disease we learn in universities, because in universities we learn that if you bring interest rates down, the economy should respond, if you put uh, liquidity into the system, amount supply should grow and the economy should grow. But this time around, when you look at how much liquidity was injected into the system by the central bank, it's massive, absolutely massive. But when you actually look at the growth of money supply, it has been very, very slow. Almost non-existent growth. How do you get something like this? But this is not the world we learn in universities. Well, <clears throat> that's exactly what we, what we went through in Japan for the previous 15 years. Rates have been brought down to zero by 1995. And 2011, Japanese economic growth is still very slow. Uh, money supply growth is still very slow. So if we study the Japanese experience well, we should be able to extricate ourselves from the current crisis much sooner because in the Japanese case, there was nothing to, to, uh, to fault. Japan was one of the first countries that experienced this very unusual disease since the Great Depression. But since the Great Depression was so far away, and in, in those days, the data was not very good. I was afraid this condition 
uh, people did not come to the, the full realization of what this disease is all about. Well, <coughs> but when, where, every time I start speaking like this, I says, there's something to be learned from the Japanese experience. I get this very nasty faces, especially in the US, UK, and some other parts of the world, who say, oh, what, what? wait a minute. Learning from Japan? Forget it. Japan did everything wrong. Too slow in non performing on disposals, too slow in the structural reform, too little, too late on monitoring and fiscal stimulus. Forget it. We have nothing to learn from Japan. Japan is a good counterexample of what not to do. <laughs> oh, sorry. I did forget something. Oh, sorry. <coughs> <laughs> So again, the, those phases, I usually start with this chart, which shows what happened to US house prices this time around compared to Japanese house prices exactly 15 years earlier. So the thick line you see here is the vocational index for the United States, and the other two thin lines are what happened to Japanese house prices in Osaka and Tokyo areas exactly 15 years earlier. And as you can see, both on the way up and on the way down, both the duration and magnitude are remarkably similar. And after I show this chart, most Americans do shut up. <laughs> oh my gosh, we're actually quite similar after all. Against this bursting of the bubble, central banks around the world drop rates very sharply. In the case of Federal Reserve, where I used to work, uh, the drop rates at the fastest rate in Federal Reserve history, down to the level of Japanese rates, almost zero, and all the other central banks also drop rates very sharply, in the case of Europe and the UK, also the lowest in their history. <coughs> but the responses of economies, I would argue, have been remarkably slow. This is the uh, case of US industrial production and unemployment rate. And yes, industrial production did return to the level of 2004, but still a long ways to go to the previous peak. Unemployment, uh, over 9%. And in the case of Europe, industrial production back to the level of 2005, but unemployment rate nearly double digit. And even this chart is very misleading when you look at individual countries in Europe. Germany is doing very well, back to the level of 2007, but the other three, France still at the level of 1997, Italy 1994, Spain 1997. They have a long ways to go before they are anywhere near but average public will consider a uh, recovery. And it's not just the industrial production that failed to increase, or the unemployment uh, that failed to increase, money supply also failed to increase in a major way. There are a lot of people in the market who believe that with all the liquidity in the system, money supply must have grown quite, quite sharply, and therefore inflation is the real concern. Well, Liquidity injected by the central bank, the blue, uh, the red line, one of the days, did increase from 100 to nearly uh, 300 for the case of the United States. <coughs> and people kind of equate this with the money supply growth. But when you actually look at the money supply growth, which is this blue line, it hardly grew during this entire period. And the green line is the credit available to the private sector. It actually fell. And we learn in schools I'm, they are not teaching this way uh, now, but at least I learned in schools that these three things are supposed to move together. If the central bank increases liquidity in the system by 10%, it should increase money supply by 10%, credit available to the private sector by 10%. And that world did exist prior to the Lima shock. Three lines moving beautifully together. So the textbook world did exist until 2008. But once the Lima shock hit, you can see the three lines going all over the map and inflation rates, instead of uh, going higher, is actually coming lower. Same thing in Europe. This is, oh, okay. <laughs> This is the um, monetary base, base money injected by the European Central Bank. But money supply growth has been very, very slow. And 
even though there was some uptick in inflation, you know, we're still talking about 1% range at the core level. And this is the UK. For UK, we, we in Japan have a little bit of fun in a sense that when modern king of Bank of England is, uh, put in this massive quantitative easing uh, two years ago, you remember him saying that we are not going to make Japanese mistake, we're going to do this quickly, we're going to do this thoroughly, and we're going to get the UK economy out of the mess very quickly, and we're going to increase money supply. And those of us in Japan were saying, okay, <laughs> let's see. Well, he certainly increased the uh, country base, but look what happened to money supply. Nothing. And credit available to the private sector actually falling. And of course, UK economy is not doing very well, house prices are still falling. And that's exactly what we went through in Japan. This is a much longer time period, but as you can see from October, uh, October 1997, why did I pick October 1997? This is when we started our financial crisis. This is when science security uh, collapsed and there was a massive uh, default in the, in the bank market and that caused the collapse of Yamaichi Securities, Tokaido Hokkaido Hakushuku Bank, and that's when uh, our financial crisis hit. Uh, bank, bank of Japan increased liquidity in the banking system massively, and listening to oh, uh, the, uh, the pressure from people like Paul Krugman, Ben Bernanke, and many others who said, just increase the quantitative easing and everything will be fine. So DOJ increased this massively. But money supply grew very, very slowly. Credit available to the private sector actually falling. And of course, the inflation rate was near zero or below zero for all this period. How do we get this result? Why is it so different this time around compared to all the other times? Well, it's because private sector has been deleveraging. And I'm sure you have heard this many times over. But uh, if, if you look at this in deep, more detail, this is what happened to Japanese corporate demand for funds since 1985. And during the bubble days here, companies were borrowing tons of money thinking that they're going to make uh, huge money by investing in all sorts of assets. And Bank of Japan was raising, this is the short-term interest rates controlled by the Bank of Japan. Bank of Japan, seeing that the economy was overheating, bubble developing, tightening, uh, uh, raising short-term interest rates to almost 8% when inflation was only around 3 trying to kill the, uh, the bubble. Then 1990, 1991, the bubble burst, and you can see demand for funds falling very, very sharply. Bank of Japan brought rates from 8% to almost 0 by 1995, and look what happens afterwards. It goes into negative. Negative means people are paying down debt with zero interest rates. And we never learned this in universities, right? Not in business schools, not in economics. Companies are not supposed to pay down debt when interest rates are down to zero. Because if that's the case, the usual interpretation is that the management of the companies are so stupid they cannot find good use of the money even with zero interest rates. If that's the case, they should just give the money back to the shareholders and let shareholders do something else with those funds. So this is not supposed to happen. But in Japan, it happened for full 10 years from 1995 all the way to 2005. And that's not because suddenly Japanese management all went bunkers. There was a reason for this behavior. And that is that all the assets they bought during the bubble days collapsed in value, but the liabilities remain on their balance sheets. So liabilities here, assets down here, they were all bankrupt. The whole country, the private sector, was literally bankrupt. But when you think about it, there are actually two types of bankruptcies. The usual type that we think about is that they come up, they come up with this car or cameras and they try to sell this, but consumers don't like it, pour in more money on advertisement, trying to sell this thing, still to no avail, eventually you run out of cash, you go bankrupt. That's the usual case. But in that case, the product that this company brought to the society was not valued by the society, so of course that's the end of the story. But there's the other type. The other type is that the cars and cameras are still selling very well. You have a cash flow. Everything is fine, your technology, your marketing, your customer base, but you're bankrupt because of the silly mistakes you made in, during this period. So you have a balance sheet on the water with a strong cash flow. What do you do if you are in that situation? 
It doesn't matter whether you're Japanese, Argentine, or, or who are Americans or whoever. When you're in that situation, the response is the same. Use the cash flow to pay down debt. Because that way, you don't, you don't have to tell your banker, banker friends that, sorry, it's all non-performing loans. You don't have to tell your shareholders, so sorry, it's all piece of paper now. And you don't have to tell your workers there's no more jobs tomorrow. So for all the stakeholders involved, the right thing to do is to use the cash flow to pay down debt. And if you continue to pay down debt, at some point your balance sheet will balance again. And you can say, I'm out of this problem. Now I'm going to go start making money again. Well, that's what Japanese were doing here. For 10 years, the entire corporate sector was paying down debt. Now at the micro level, that is the right thing to do. If I, if I running one of those companies, if I were running, running one of these companies, I would have done the same thing. And if you were running one of these companies, I'm sure you would have done the same thing as well. But the problem is, when everybody does it all at the same time, what happens to the national economy? The national economy, if someone is saving money or paying down debt, you then have someone on the other side borrowing and spending money to keep the GDP going. In the usual economy, there will be a financial types people like my company, Nomura, will be in there taking the money from this group, giving it to the people on the other side, make sure that this money goes and the economy moves forward. And if there are too many borrowers for the saved funds, rates are raised. Too few borrowers for the borrowed, uh, saved funds, rates are lowered until the entire sum is borrowed and spent at the end of the day. That's how macroeconomy is supposed to, to run. But in this situation, even with zero interest rates, people are paying down debt. And they pay, people are paying down debt because they have balance sheet problems. They're technically bankrupt. And in this situation, these people are not going to come to borrow money at any interest rate. And there won't be many lenders to these guys either, especially when the bankers themselves have balance sheet problems. So in this situation, what happens? All the saved funds, all the repaid debt comes into the banking system and it gets stuck. It cannot go out anymore. So if I may give you a numerical example, suppose I'm a member of the household sector, I get thousand dollars of income, I decide to save nine hundred I decide to spend nine hundred, save hundred dollars. This nine hundred that I spend is already someone else's income, so it's circulating in the economy, this is not a problem. Now this hundred dollars that I decide to save go through the financial sector. It's usually lent to someone who borrows and spends it, 900 plus 100,000 dollars against the original income of 1,000 dollars, the economy moves forward. Too many borrowers, rates are raised, too few borrowers, rates are lower, that's the usual world. But in this world, I get 1,000 dollars of income, I spend 900, decide to save 100 dollars, and the 100 dollars gets stuck in the financial system because there are no borrowers even with zero interest rates, and you cannot bring rates any lower than zero. So only $900 spent. That's someone else's income. When that person gets the $900 and says, okay, let's save 10%, what happens? He spends $810, decides to save $90, and the $90 gets stuck in the banking system again. Because as you can see, this process goes on for 10 years. So if you do nothing about the situation, the economy will shrink from 1,000, 900, 810, 730, very, very quickly, even with zero interest rates. And you may say, Jay, anything like this ever happened before? Well, when you go back to the Great Depression and ex understand what was happening with the bank balance sheets and so forth, you realize that this is exactly what was happening during the Great Depression. Everybody was paying down there because all these people leveraged themselves up during the pre-October 1929 period. And then once the asset prices collapsed, liabilities remained, everybody started paying down debt all at the same time. But there was no one on the other side borrowing and spending money. So the United States lost 46% of its GDP in just four years, 1929-1933, because it went into this process. Now when you look at the Japanese numbers, some of those bigger years of corporate deleveraging, over 30 trillion yen a year, 6% of Japan's GDP. And this is just the corporate, corporate side of the picture. On top of this, we have the household sector. The household sector in Japan, as you know, you know they love to save money. If that was 4% of GDP, and this is 6% of GDP, you add the two together, Japan could have lost 10% of GDP every year. That's exactly the Great Depression scenario. Well, what happened to Japan's GDP during this period? 
This is what happened to Japan GDP against uh, asset prices. In the Japanese case, asset prices were led by commercial real estate. That's one difference between the US and the Japanese case. In the Japanese case, commercial real estate prices led the bubble and house prices followed. In the US, it's the other way around. As you can see, uh, during the late 80s, commercial real estate prices uh, skyrocketed, people fell rich, spent a lot of money, GDP went up. Yeah, that anyone can explain. But what's remarkable about the Japanese experience is what happened afterwards. The bubble burst in 1990-1991, commercial real estate prices start collapsing. It, it collapses 87% of the week. Just try to imagine commercial real estate prices down 87%. It's not a very pretty picture. I mean, try to imagine the United States economy with prices down 87% in San Francisco, 87% in Los Angeles, 87% down in Florida, Manhattan, Boston. What kind of economy do you think are left in the US, right? Against this massive collapse and private sector deleveraging to uh, try to repair balance sheets, Japanese GDP never fell below the peak of the bubble. This is peak of the bubble both in real terms and nominal terms, it never fell below the peak of the bubble. How did we manage to do that? Right. Well, the answer is very simple. Government came in and borrowed the hundred dollars and spent it. If government comes in and borrowed the hundred dollars and spent it, it's 900 plus 100 against the original income of thousand dollars, there's no reason for GDP to fall. Next year, same thing happens. Household saving, companies not borrowing. Why same thing happens year after year after year? Well, with this much fall in asset prices, one or two years of debt repayment is not enough. For some companies, it may take five years, others may take 10. If you're unlucky enough to have bought at the peak, it may take 20 years before your balance sheet is repaired. But as long as you have cash flow, you continue to do that. So year after year after year, the same thing happens. And year after year after year, Japanese uh, government came in and bought the money. As a result, we have this huge public debt problem in Japan. Uh, this is a government spending, and this is a tax revenue. Tax revenue fell even with the GDP staying above the peak of the bubble because of what happened to our asset prices. And this chart in Japan is known as the alligator's mouth. <laughs> and it somehow refuses to close. Uh, it's a huge gap here, and that, of course, is the budget deficit. This is the budget deficit. If you measure from 1990 all the way to 2005, because 2005, corporate debt repayment stops. And add all these deficits together, it's 460 trillion yen. That's 92% of Japan's GDP. It's no peanuts. But I would argue that this was a money very well spent, because when you go back to this chart, uh, try to imagine the counterfactual, that is, if the government did not take this action, what would have happened to Japan's GDP? The chances are high that Japan's GDP would have fallen like this, or perhaps to be too flawed by now, because the amount of wealth Japan lost as a result of bursting of the bubble is equivalent to three years worth of Japan's GDP, uh, Japan's 1990 GDP. The amount of wealth the Americans lost during the Great Depression with the stock prices collapsing, was equivalent to one year's worth of 1929 GDP. So we lost three times more wealth as a result of the bursting of the bubble. And with one year's loss, US GDP fell 46%. Three years worth should be more than 46%. What I drew here, this dotted red line is, you know, 46% is too much even for my own, own purposes. So I just brought it to the level before the bubble. And the bubble started around 1986, so I just drew this line to bring the, the GDP back to the level of 1985. If you compare this GDP, which is, in my view, pretty optimistic, given the damage to the, to the, to the system, and the actual GDP over a 15-year period, so it's the area between these two lines, it's over 2,000 trillion. So basically, Japan spent 460 trillion and got the uh, GDP 2,000 trillion. That's a pretty good deal. This is why I say that money was very well spent. 
Now, of course, some went to the bridges to nowhere, some went to the roads to nowhere. You know, the journalists got nothing better to do, went around Japan with a microscope and found a few projects that were bad, and they made a big issue out of it. But the whole point is not how the money was spent, but the fact that money was spent. Because that's what kept the GDP from collapsing altogether. So the point here is that if you're in this type of recession, where private sector is minimizing debt even with zero interest rates, that means private sector is actually sick, very sick. And in that situation, if the government uh, did not come in to borrow the, this uh, extra savings in the system, the whole thing would have crashed. So <clears throat> basically what Japan proved was that if the government comes in from the very beginning with a proper fiscal stimulus, not monetary stimulus, fiscal stimulus, to keep the GDP going, you can keep the economy going, allow the private sector to have the income to repair the balance sheets. End of the day, the private sector would have uh, repaired balance sheets with the GDP not falling. How much of this lesson is understood in the G20 context? Well, I'm happy to tell you that G20 actually understood this quite well because this chart was used during the emergency, emergency G20 meeting held in Washington, D.C., November 2008 by Japanese Prime Minister Haro Aso. And he used this chart to show that, look, we had 87% decline in asset values, and we're still able to keep the GDP from falling. Now, the world hasn't experienced anything like 87% decline in asset values. If all of us put in the fiscal stimulus, we should be able to keep the GDP from falling. And the entire G20 agreed. So, 2009, all the countries put in the fiscal stimulus. The world, uh, world economy stopped collapsing. So, that was good. Well, actually, there are two parts to the Japanese lesson. And it's the second part that uh, Mr. Aso probably did not get to talk about during the uh, emergency G20 meeting November 2008. What's the second part? Well, when you look at this Japanese GDP movements closely, you notice that there are two bouts of negative growth here, 1997, 2001. What happened on 1997 and 2001? Well, on both occasions, Japanese government tried to reduce budget deficit. And at that time, in 1997, I was already advising Prime Minister Hashimoto, and I said, no, you don't cut budget deficit now. If you cut the whole thing, will come crashing down. But those days, well, there were IMF, OECD, those people who know nothing about anything, <laughs> at least in those days. They're getting a little better now, but uh, they said, come on, you, uh, Japan is running such a large budget deficit, it's producing zero GDP growth, you have an aging population, they're building bridges to nowhere, why don't you cut this deficit? And even though I said, no, you don't cut now, I'm just a private sector economist, not even Japanese, and all these big shots from around the world, and people within the ministry were all saying cut the budget deficit, so he did. The whole program was supposed to reduce budget deficit by 3% of Japan's GDP, 15 trillion yen, by raising taxes and cutting spending. <coughs> Here's what happened. When the measure was put in place, the entire Japanese economy collapsed. We have five quarters of negative growth Budget deficit not only failed to decline by 15 trillion, it actually increased by 16 trillion. So this is the uh, chart of what happened. The white area is the tax receipts, and the purple area is the, the budget deficit. In 1997, we were somewhere around here. We we're supposed to reduce this deficit by 15 trillion. It actually increased by 16 and the tax receipts fell because the economy collapsed. And four years later, Prime Minister Koizumi, one, one Prime Minister I did not uh, advise, uh, he had decided, he had a much, much milder form of uh, fiscal consolidation by trying to limit the issuance of Japanese government bonds to 30 trillion yen a year. Now 30 trillion yen is 6% of GDP, it's a huge budget deficit. But at that time, if you remember, IT bubble was bursting around the world, the economy was weakening, even 30 trillion was not enough, but he tried to keep it at 30. As a result, the economy collapsed, tax receipts fell, but the deficit increased again. And it literally took us 10 years to climb out of these mistakes. And with huge addition to, in my view, unnecessary budget deficit. So my point is that when you are in this type of recession, the last thing you do is fiscal consolidation because it will just make the situation worse and worse and worse. 
if government pulls the plug, when private sector is still deleveraging with zero interest rates, the economy will go down, go down the drain first, tax receipts will collapse, the budget deficit could actually increase at the end of the day. How much of this is understood around the world? Well, I'm afraid, next to zero. Uh, this is the, if I may start with Spain, this is the Spanish flow of funds data. Flow of funds, I'm sure many of you, especially for those of you from Central Bank, I'm sure are aware of how to read this stuff, but let me just say, quickly explain how this chart is put together. There's a horizontal line going across at zero. Above zero, financial surplus means people saving money. Below zero, financial deficit means people say, uh, borrowing and investing money. And there are four lines here, the rest of the world line, household line, general government, and the corporate sector. These four lines are supposed to add up to zero. So what this shows is that in each of these years, which part of Spanish economy was borrowing money, which part of Spanish economy was, was saving money. And when you look at this government line, you notice that during the bubble days, government was above zero. Above zero means they were running financial surplus, uh, a budget surplus. And once the bubble burst, you see this line going deeply into the financial deficit, meaning government running large budget deficit. It's over 10% of GDP, and everybody's saying, oh my gosh, Spain is finished, it's bankrupt, uh, we have a horrendous problem, problems. Now, if you just look at this in isolation, and say, wow, but you never said Spain is 10% of GDP, over 10% of GDP, that looks very bad. I agree. But then when you look at what's been happening to the Spanish private sectors, both uh, households and the corporate sector in Spain was below zero during the bubble days. It means both sectors were borrowing and investing money. But once the bubble burst, people realized that, oh my gosh, we, we, have, we have to repair our balance sheets. And both lines are now above zero. Corporate line shooting massively, household line also moving up. And if you add this line and that line together, it's 17% of Spanish GDP, which means uh, instead of borrowing and investing money, the Spanish household sector suddenly decided to use all their cash flow to pay down debt. And the gap between here and here, 17% of Spanish GDP. So if nothing was done to this situation, Spanish GDP would have contracted by 17%. Against this, the government increased the budget deficit by 11%. So basically what happened in Spain was that Spanish private sector decided to deliver, pay down debt. But of that deflationary uh, gap, government came in to borrow the 11% of that 17%, put that back into the income stream. So that's still far better than nothing, but this number is smaller than that one meaning that there was a large deflationary gap left in the system. And it's no coincidence today that Spain is suffering from 20.1% unemployment rate today. 21.3, near depression scenario. Situation in Ireland, even worse. Uh, government was running a surplus during the bubble days and then fell deeply into the deficit. When you look at the private sectors of Ireland, the private sector was doing just the opposite. Massive savings uh, to, to repair their balance sheets. So, uh, and this increase in private sector, if you add the two together, is 30, nearly 34% of GDP against government increasing uh, deficit to the tune of 30% of GDP. Well, today, as you know, our Irish GDP is down 20% from the peak already and it looks like it's still falling. Because in some sense, yes, the budget deficit in Ireland is large, but it's not large enough to offset what's been happening to the private sector. But unfortunately, for some reason, everybody's paying attention to the green line, very few people paying attention to the red and blue lines. And just looking at this, they say, oh my gosh, I, Ireland is, is finished. But in all of these recessions, what I call balance recessions, there is a massive increase in private sector savings. And it's, it's this increase in savings that is causing the recession. And the government is simply responding to it, trying to make the worse situation from getting even, even worse. Same thing in Portugal. You see, well, Portuguese government was running a budget deficit even during the best of times. I mean, that was bad. 
but you do see a private sector increasing savings after the crisis. And the UK, UK is not part of the Eurozone, but you see very significant change in private sector behavior here after the bursting of the bubble. So yes, UK government increased uh, deficit to the tune of 7.3% from here to here, but if you add the two private sector lines together, it's 8.7% of the UK GDP. So even in the UK, I would argue that yes, budget deficit is large, but it's not large enough to stabilize the UK economy. As you know, the UK economy is not doing very well, house prices are still falling. Now, Italy, well, Italy didn't show much movement one way or the other. Maybe Italians were not too involved in the bubble, so the lines at the above and below are more or less the same. Then comes to Greece, this one. I'm afraid the Greek situation is quite different from the rest of Europe, in that they had a large budget deficit to begin with, and it got worse later uh, in a more recent period. And even though there were some movements to within the private sector to the other, those were not enough to cover what was happening on the government side. And on top of that, of course, Greece wasn't uh, publicized, uh, reporting the correct numbers until the new government came in. So those two things together, the fact that the private sector is not generating enough savings, and the fact that they were uh, publishing misleading numbers, those two make the Greek situation uh, very different from the rest of Europe. So for the case of Greece, I'm afraid uh, they will have to do some fiscal consolidation, maybe a large fiscal consolidation to win the trust of the market uh, and to offset the shortage of savings domestically. But for the rest of Europe to go fiscal consolidation because they don't want to be in a situation that the Greece is in now is a massive mistake, in my view. They're making the same mistake Japan made in 1997. All the United States, for that matter, in 1937. President Roosevelt, uh, by 1937, U.S. GDP was more than stuck to the level of 1929. He thought, wow, the economy is fine, we can cut our budget deficit. So he tried to do that, and the economy collapsed one more time, 1937. And it literally took Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor to get the U.S. economy out of that mess again. Now, <clears throat> how about the U.S.? Well, uh, as you can see, this U.S. chart is pretty messy. And as someone carrying an American passport, a former Federal Reserve employee, I'm ashamed to say this, but the last three years of U.S. flow of funds data are absolute garbage. <laughs> complete garbage. And it's very easy to find out why they're garbage. You add the numbers together, they don't add up to zero. They don't add up to zero at all. And I was so annoyed by that, and because my analysis, is balance sheet recession analysis, we have to look at this data. I went up to my, returned to my former employer at the Board of Governors at the Federal Reserve in Washington, and confronted the people who put this data together. and said, how come our numbers don't add up? And he says, ooh, you found out. <laughs> Which means no one else found this out. Uh, so I asked him, why are our numbers are so bad during the last three years? And he said, it's all because of the financial crisis. All the estimates are completely off the map, and they cannot get good numbers for the private sector house, uh, households and the companies. And so he said, uh, please wait two years. Then we get the real number. You don't have to do the estimates. And I said, look, the policymakers, those of us in the market, we don't have two years to wait. We have to make decisions now. So I confronted them with this data. Uh, what this data shows is that uh, the red line here is by adding the households and the corporate sector together to come up with the private sector. The blue line is subtracting the other two from zero. Other two meaning the government and the rest of the world from zero. And those are supposed to come to the same number, right? Because four lines added together is supposed to be a zero. And if you look at the past, even in the past, U.S. numbers are sometimes off. But most recently, you know, some of these lines were completely off. So I asked the person, if you have to make a guess, uh, would the red line move toward the blue or blue toward the red going forward as, as revisions are made? And immediately the response was, the red will move toward blue. 
And the reason was very simple. In order to get the red number, uh, sorry, in order to get the blue number, you have to have only two numbers, budget deficit and the trade deficit. And these numbers are available every month. They are not uh, hugely revised. And they, you don't need to do any estimations because they are available as a solid primary number. The, the, to get the red number, you have to look at every category of financial assets held by private sector and see what the liabilities increased, assets fell, all of that, and you have to put them together. So <clears throat> the person said, the red will move towards blue, but if that's the case, and even if the red number is true, U.S. private sector deleveraging is nearly 12% of U.S. GDP, third only after Ireland and Spain. This is no time for U.S. to reduce budget deficit. And the fact that this is happening with zero interest rates, the private sector is saving nearly 7% of GDP, even with zero interest rates, suggests to me that this is no time to cut budget deficit. Unfortunately, as Tom Ferguson mentioned at a morning session, U.S. political scene is in a mess, and somehow even President Obama uh, convinced himself that he should be doing something about the budget deficit. <clears throat> I find that very, very unfortunate because what he did with the 2009 package was the right way to go. Massive fiscal stimulus, and I think that's the fiscal stimulus that kept the U.S. economy going up to now. But as you know, that package is now expiring, which is now coinciding with the economic weakness. So we, we really need to renew that. Uh, but very, only very few people in the United States fully understand this, this, this mechanism. But compared to Europe, where the only game in town is cutting the budget deficit, at least within the US, I'm happy to tell you that Mr. Renanke, Mr. Goolsby, CEA chairman, these people are beginning to understand this mechanism. And I had an honor to testify with Chairman Renanke on the Humphrey Hawkins testimony, this twice yearly testimony that the Federal Reserve Chairman has to vote in front of Congress. I was also invited to that event, and it was in July of last year. Uh, all these congressmen from the Republican side, thinking that Mr. Benenke is one of them, kept on asking him, is this time to cut the budget deficit? We don't want to leave any debt to the grandchildren, and, and all that kind of you know, very emotional talks. And Mr. Benenke kept on saying, no. It's okay to come up with a long-term plan to reduce budget deficit, but if we do it now, the US economy could collapse. And that's very different from what he used to say just a year and a half ago. If you remember what he used to say a year and a half ago, when the initial fiscal stimulus began to get the US economy going, he started saying, okay, you can, we have to cut budget deficit, Federal Reserve will be able to keep the US economy going. Remember that line? Well, he's not saying that anymore. And during the, uh, the session, since we were seated together, I went to Mr. Renegi, presented my book, and he said, I already read it. And I found, and he said, the part on Japan was very, very useful. And you fully understand this now. So that's why I think his, his view is changing, which is good. And I also uh, spoke with Mr. Goolsby, CEA chairman, and I presented my book, and he said, I already read it. I'm making my staffers read it. Uh, so at least, within the U.S., some part of the policymakers are beginning to realize that this is balanced recession. This is no ordinary recession at all. But unfortunately, that is not fully shared higher up, meaning President Obama. And he's still talking about reducing budget deficit, which I find it very unfortunate. And the rest of the American public. And I think the key point here is that even though some people are beginning to understand this particular mechanism, uh, it's not taught in universities. Right? Balance recession is the term I came up with. And now a lot of people in the market use it, and policymakers also use it, but it's not understood as a, as a general knowledge among, uh, among uh, ordinary citizens. And of course they are a much larger majority. So before coming this way to, to Argentina, I actually stopped by Washington, talked to uh, White House officials, and I insisted that he should tell President Obama to come out and say, come out and tell the American people 
that we actually have a different disease. We have actually contracted a different disease. This is not the same virus. This is not common cold. This is pneumonia. Because unless that is done, average people will continue to believe that, hey, this is just common cold with perhaps a little additional complications. I can just go to the pharmacy, buy Tylenol or whatever, and then I should be okay. You know, as long as average people think that way, and when you send them the medical bill for the fiscal stimulus, people will be very upset. But once you tell them that this is actually pneumonia, and we're actually treating it, then people say, well, yeah, I, I kind of feel this different from the ordinary cold, maybe it is pneumonia. And once that is understood, I think fiscal uh, stimulus will become more acceptable. Of course, there will be always some people who never accept fiscal stimulus at, at, even with any evidence. But I think average Americans, once the president come out and explain to them that this is a different disease, uh, I think they will say, yeah, it makes sense. Everybody's paying down there. No one's borrowing money. If that continues, the economy will contract. We need the government uh, to do the opposite of the private sector in these, these unusual circumstances. And I told this uh, friend at the White House to tell the president that you should agree with the Republicans in the following way. If the private sector is healthy, very forward-looking, a lot of interesting investment ideas that they want to put into place, but the government's out there trying to borrow money and then private sector and public sector competing with each other, then of course you have to cut budget deficit. That's the crowding out situation. But today, private sector is deleveraging with zero interest rates. Private sector is actually sick. And in that situation, they need government help. Once you put it this way, even Republicans will not be able to refuse because the data shows that private sector is deleveraging with zero interest rates. But I don't know whether he told President Obama, uh, um, I'm not so optimistic reading the re uh, reports in the past few days. But those are the kind of things that are necessary to educate the people that there's actually two types of recessions, ordinary recession and this type of recession. And this type of recession happens only after bursting of a nationwide asset price bubble financed with debt. And this type of recession, as a result, don't happen very often. I would think that the next time we will face something like this is after we are all dead. Because as long as we are alive, we're not going to make the same mistake again. Uh, so that's going to be 30 or 40 years later, and the budget deficit should be cleaned up over this, this period of time. Now, uh, how about Japan? Well, I'm well over my time, so I, I will skip the main chart. Let me get to the key point about the Japanese uh, situation now. Japanese corporate balances are now the cleanest in the world. Nearly half of Japanese companies, listed companies, have no debt whatsoever. So they're really cleaned up. They're doing very well technologically otherwise. But there's a problem. And that is that after paying down debt for nearly 15 years, these guys are saying, never again. We never want to borrow money again. I never want to see those bankers again. And that's what happens when people go through this experience. The Americans who lived through the Great Depression and the children who remember seeing parents going through the Great Depression never borrow money until they die. The trauma could be that bad. And we have this problem in Japan. Even the Japanese bankers are most willing lenders, interest rates lowest in human history, companies are saying no. Oh, enough with that experience. We never want to borrow money again. And as a result, we, even though balance sheets are repaired, we are facing what I call the exit problem, exit challenge, to get over this trauma. The entrance problem, we, where the United States and Europe are, entrance problem is the challenge of repairing balance sheets. There's no two ways about it, but the private sector must repair the balance sheets. But the exit problem is what to do after the balance sheets are repaired. Will they come and borrow money or not? This is a chart showing what happened to U.S. interest rates after the Great Depression. Well, 20 is the U.S. rates, both short term and long term, if you average this all out, was 4.1%. Then the Great Depression hit, rates fell very sharply, and it took United States 30 years, 3 zero, until 1959 to bring the rates back up to 4%. Because private sector so it says, never again, never want to borrow money again. 
during these 30 years, there were three massive fiscal uh, expansions. The New Deal policies, astronomical fiscal expansion called the World War II, and there's a Korean War. And even with that three massive fiscal expansion, interest rates refused to go up until 19, late 1950s. That shows how big the trauma was within the private sector toward borrowing and spending money. And those of you who are old enough to remember, remember until around 1985, almost every interest payment was tax deductible in the United States. Whether it's a student loan, auto loan, loan from loan sharks, whatever the case may be, they're all tax deductible all the way until 1985 because the U.S. government had encouraged us to borrow. Of course, then they went to the opposite extreme and we don't have to buy afterwards. Uh, but that's the challenge the Japan is faced with. And it's actually the same challenge the Germans are faced with. Germany went through a uh, balance sheet recession actually uh, during the what they call telecom bubble. Year 2000, everybody in Germany were crazy about the stock market. And then the telecom bubble burst, and you can see corporate sector, which was borrowing huge amounts of money during the uh, bubble days, suddenly decided to pay down debt, and they remain above zero, even though their balance sheets, I was told, are more or less cleaned up by 2005. And the household sector also increased savings. So in Germany, both household sectors and uh, corporate sectors are either paying down debt or saving money, which is very, very unhealthy in my view. This line should be down here, not over here. Uh, and this is why German banks have no choice but to buy assets from somewhere else, whether it's uh, subprime paper from the United States or uh, Greek bonds and Irish bonds, because there's no one in Germany borrowing money. And because of the uh, Maastricht Treaty limitations, German government will only issue budget deficit to the two, two or three percent of GDP, so the rest of the money had to go outside of Germany, and that's why they got into all the problems they are faced uh, today. So Germany and Japan, their problem is how to overcome this trauma of debt. But for the rest of the world, their challenge is how to maintain this stimulus so that private sector has the money to pay down debt, repair the balance sheets, and then afterwards you reverse wrong. That is, once the private sector balance sheets are repaired, private sector is borrowing money, then the government should be reducing its budget deficit. And I think they have plenty of time to reduce the budget deficit because the next time we see something like this, after we are all dead, and so I think there are a few more years uh, to repair the balance sheets. But right now, I'm afraid we're not going in the right way. Also, the political debate, as we heard in the morning sessions, uh, for the uh, fiscal, fiscal consolidation, orthodoxy is backing with uh, full force. So I'm not that optimistic in that sense. Uh, but if the economy does weaken as a result. Maybe people will wake up to this this need that uh, fiscal policy was used for after all. Thank you very much. There's another lesson from Japan in the 1930s when the Minister of Finance tried an exit strategy. You never mentioned Minsky moment because all what you say has been rehabilitated. Minsky, uh, 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 sorry, Evelyn Fisher, debt deflection theory, just a variant of this with huge financial interconnection. Why did you not mention this Minsky moment in economic theory? Well, Mins Minsky came up with the mechanism of how you get the bubble. Yeah. I'm interested in how to solve the problem solve. after the bubble. Yes. Bubble first. Yes. And I don't think Minsky went into these big details about how to solve the problem once you're in this, what I call, balancing recession. And the Fisher case, I explained this in great detail in my book. I think got it wrong. For Fisher's debt deflation to, for Fisher's debt deflation to happen, he has to have this fire cell of assets. Yeah. 
But we can have balance sheet recession without fire sale of, of anything. As long as private sector gets worried about the balance sheets and start paying down debt, that's the only thing you need to get into this world. So that's the key difference between my argument and his. And he, because he, real, he his theory is based on this concept of deflation. Deflation was the key uh, driver. He suggested the central bank should reflate. But I hate to say this in front of the Argentinian central bankers, but in this type of recession, I'm afraid, monetary policy is largely out of business. And as a former central banker myself from the New York Fed, I hate to say this, but when private sector is deleveraging, even with zero interest rates, money multiply is negative at margin. There's no way you can increase money supply even with the liquidity or the liquidity injected into the system. And so in this type of recession, I'm afraid Fisher type of uh, reflation solution won't work very well. You have to have a government borrowing and spending money. So many hands. <laughs> Uh, I think you were, Richard, you were very <coughs> convincing. I think you also ought to add for fairness the fact that the bond, the public bond market in Japan is only internal. In other words, the Japanese bonds don't circulate elsewhere. So you don't have the problem we have, all of us. And that is showing the prudence of the Japanese. Honor to them. Well, uh, a lot of people make that comment, which I cannot disagree more. <laughs> Japanese investors have all the choices in the world to buy foreign paper. And we at Lorana make a huge business peddling Brazilian paper, Australian paper, Canadian paper. Why should Japanese have to sit with 10-year bonds at 1.2% when there are so many interesting papers all around the world. But even with that, and there are a lot of money that did flow out of Japan, there was still sufficient sum left to finance the budget deficit in Japan. And in the Japanese case, because Japan is running a trade surplus, there's always this danger of yen appreciation. And Japanese uh, institutional investors, like insurance companies, banks and trusts, lost massive amounts of money as the yen continued to appreciate. And that's what kept the Japanese investors, at least the institutional investors, from going out of Japan. Now, I think a lot more investors around the world are beginning to understand my point. And as a chief economist of Nobra, I have to agree investors all around the world, that's my business. Uh, if you look at the bond yield in the United States today, it's, for the 10-year bonds, 2.8%. For a country running both the current account deficit and the budget deficit. And the budget deficit is 9% of US GDP. When I start my business with the New York Fed, President Reagan was running the show. Budget deficit was only 6% of GDP. <laughs> Bond yield was 14%. Now the budget deficit is 50% more as a percentage of GDP, 9%. The bond yield is 2.8. How do you explain this? Once you understand this mechanism, you see why it's 2.8, then it could actually go even lower. This chart shows the budget deficit, which is the pink line, and the blue line is the excess savings in the private sector of the United States. That's the money that private sector generated as savings, but not, not borrowed by the private sector. And as you can see, in earlier days, the entire budget deficit had to be financed with foreign money during President Bush's days. But more recently, because the private sector in the U.S. is generating so much uh, savings, you have to rely only this portion from foreign sources. And I think this is the reason why bond yield in the United States is 2.8%, not 14%. So as more and more investors come to realize that there's this excess savings, private sector source not borrowing money, the only borrower left in the US is the US government. And that's the same situation in UK as well. Yeah. Yes, I, I come from Spain. I was in Spain on Monday. Uh, 
And uh, even though they didn't see this chart, which are very, very interesting, it's fascinating presentation. I don't think the Spanish government wanted to go the way they, they went. They didn't want to reduce the value deficit so aggressively. It's not a choice. It's, it's because people don't even want to invest in Spanish bonds. They, they didn't really have a choice. So, it, I mean, it's also not talking to the governments, it's talking to the investors. If you convince investors about your point, I think that's more important than Simpson. And the other point I want to raise is that the, um, in the Japanese way, I understand what goes on, but still the results of the Japanese economy have been very, very weak during the, this very weak recovery phase. So I wonder whether, I mean, something else could have been done. Just increasing the deficit and nothing else doesn't seem to be a very attractive choice. Uh, let me start with the Japanese question first. As I said, Japanese corporate balances are very clean. They're doing very well all around the world, but they're not borrowing money. And that is the thing that's holding the Japanese domestic growth from, from its full potential. And what I, together with Prime Minister Aso, who, was, uh, who understood this completely, and that's why he was able to make that presentation at Emergency G20 meeting in Washington, November 2008, we were trying to come up with various investment tax, investment tax credits to encourage Japanese companies to borrow money. Uh, the kind of program actually President Obama already put in November, uh, December of last year, that if you invest this year, you can write off everything during the first year, that kind of programs. And just as we were working on these programs, Lehman Brothers collapsed. And when the Lehman Brothers collapsed, Japanese industrial production fell to the level of 1983. <laughs> lower than in the US, even lower than in Europe. Because Japan was so heavily concentrated in making good, durable goods, the whole, whole economy is concentrated in making good, durable goods. And when the Lehman shock hit, it's the durable consumption that collapsed all around the world, including Japan. So we were hit proportionally more than many other countries. And with industrial production level of 25 years ago, who wants investment tax credit. I mean, there's excess capacity everywhere. So the whole program, I'm afraid, had to be discontinued, which I thought was very, very unfortunate. But that's the kind of program we need in Japan to get this economy moving again. Now, yes, Japan took 15 years until its balance sheets are repaired. But I would argue that the last five, six years were totally unnecessary. If the Japan did not make the mistake in 1997, trying to cut budget deficit prematurely, we would have come out of that recession much sooner than 2005, 2006. So that's the mistake I don't want Spain and other countries to make. Now, going back to the Spanish issue, and that's true with Italy and, and many other countries within the Eurozone. Eurozone is in a very special case, because even though Spanish people are generating this massive savings, they have this alternative to buy German bonds to the same exchange rate characteristics. If they feel Spain is going down the drain, with the government tries to cut budget deficit, the economy weakens further, budget deficit increases, government tries to cut even more, and then the economy weakens further, gets worse and worse and worse and worse. If I'm a Spanish investor, I don't want to buy a bonds here. The situation is looks hopeless. But suppose EU or ECB come out and said, wait a minute, Spain is in a different is suffering from a different disease we got the wrong diagnosis. We want Spain to run a larger, larger budget deficit, stabilize, stabilize the GDP first, and then once the private sector balance sheet in Spain is repaired, then we want Spanish, Spanish government to cut budget deficit. Once a completely different view is offered on the table, then I think the situation would change. But as you know, no one is pitching this argument in, in Europe at the moment. Everybody's on one side. Uh, uh, trying to reduce budget deficit. No one is saying, wait a minute, that may be a wrong thing to do. Now the IMF, and I went to IMF many times to make this argument, and now they're understanding this uh, better than most other agencies in the United States. The IMF is beginning to understand this. And in all these uh, policy debates, IMF is the one saying, no, let's go slowly on fiscal consolidation. It's ECB and the EU that's trying to push the fiscal consultation uh, faster. Uh, 
But if more and more people in, in Europe began saying, wait a minute, maybe we have a different disease, not the same disease that, uh, that affected countries in the earlier days, maybe there will be another possibility for, for Spain as well. But I just don't see that. Everybody's on the, on the fiscal consolidation camp. No one is saying uh, that that may be a wrong, wrong way to go. And those arguments must come from ECD and EU or the IMF. Spain alone cannot make that argument because if the Spanish government alone makes that argument, more money will flow to, to German bonds. And so it has to be an international effort, I'm afraid. Yes. Of just a short question. Sorry, just in a quarter of an hour we have a session that will stop, so let's bring down two, two more people and we stop. Mine is just a question, short one. Can you see the various annual report which was released last week, which goes fully against what you say? What do you think about it? Well, I said orthodoxy is back. <laughs> that's, that's what's so scary about the situation. We went through this in Japan. I mean, everything I said here, we went through in Japan, the same debate. After the initial fiscal stimulus, fiscal, fiscal stimulus always works, right? Because government spends the money and GDP recovers. This produces the complacency that, ah, uh, fiscal policy worked, on priming is working, let's cut the budget deficit. And it's that danger that I think the entire world is facing now. This recovery is not actually pump priming recovery. It's entirely from government spending. So when this cut, the whole thing will come crashing down again. Uh, but until it crashes, I guess people will not wake up to that fact. It's unfortunate, but... Richard, they handed me this and said it's the last question. So could you, could you just expand, please, on your analysis of alternative fiscal instruments to deal with this? I have in mind the following. In the U.S., the Obama administration now is signaling they might try to extend the Social Security tax cut, uh, a rate cut, another year. Um, there's talk about a corporate tax revision. In the United States, there is always talk about cutting individual income taxes. What of those instruments do you think might work? I mean, on the face of it, it seems if you're going to deleverage, you just hand folks more money most of the time. They just keep deleveraging. Is that where, where where is that reasoning wrong? You mentioned the accelerated depreciation case, for example. Just what, what's your take on that? Well, acceleration, accelerated depreciation in the United States, I'm afraid, is not going to be very effective <laughs> because balance sheets are still underwater. In Japan, where balance is already repaired, accelerated depreciation may work. That's the key difference between the US program and the one that I was proposing for the Japanese. For the other taxes, income tax cut and so forth, they are better than nothing, but very inefficient ways of repairing this problem, in my view. That for the same $1 increase in budget deficit, you may get 20 or 30 cents worth of, of help to the economy. Whereas if the government spends $1, you actually get $1 of GDP increase. And so they are better than nothing, but I'm afraid they are very inefficient ways, very costly ways to keep the uh, US economy going. But until President Obama comes out and says, this is a different disease. We, we have to treat it differently. A new virus was just discovered and the virus operates differently. Something like that. I'm afraid they're stuck in this current framework uh, that private sector is more or less healthy and they are taxed too much and therefore government's a problem, not the private sector. Well, please join me in congratulations.